Right, so I think we, can, we are going to start uh, right now. Um, so first of all, I would like to thank everyone for coming, uh, the panelists, but also the, um, those who join us online from everywhere in the world, um, uh, especially when we consider that today is Mother's Day, which I apparently have forgotten. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so, so first of all, thank you everyone. And uh, this is the launch event of the special issue of philosophy today, which was just uh, released uh, last week and um, everyone can uh, find it online. And all these articles of this special issue, uh, philosophy after automation um, is open access throughout May, June and July. So before the end of July, you are able to access this uh, special issue uh, for free. Um, so I hope it will be, uh, um, if you, you didn't have time to read it before, I hope that uh, you have chance to read them uh, after this launch and hope that you will enjoy it. So uh, maybe, so as, a, as, a, as um, a launch event, maybe I will explain, you know, how are we going to proceed? So, um, I'm going to give a, um, um, an explanation, or I'm going to give an introduction of, uh, um, of, the, of the launch event, but also to explain you know, why, why, why uh, this subject was raised, um, philosophy after automation. And then we are going to have response from our panelists who are also contributors to our uh, to the special issue. So uh, uh, to, uh, this evening we, or today we have uh, we have a Peter Lemons who is uh, uh, teaching in in Nijmegen. We also have uh, 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 Michal who is teaching in the, at the University of of, of Kotwic, uh, in Poland. We also have uh, uh, Babette Babic, um, a professor of philosophy at uh, at the For Forham University in New York. We also have Anna. Anna Longo, who is a, a, a director of the uh, uh, Collège International de Philosophie in Paris. Uh, and we also have a Catherine, uh, Katerina, um, who is uh, teaching in, I always don't know how to pronounce the name of the city. <laughs> how, to, how to pronounce the name of the city? And, I, uh, and, you, uh, and also the last name. Uh, it's spelled phonetically, so it's pronounced Kolozova, as yeah. it's spelled, and the city is pronounced also uh, uh, phonetically, Skopje. <laughs> so, ah, Skopje, okay. Thank yeah, you. it comes right. from ancient Greek Skopje, view. Ah, okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, wonderful. So we are we are going to so that's the the, the procedure that we are going to have, and then uh, up, uh, later we are going to have uh, Q and A's. And I think that everyone can find the Q and A uh, button at the bottom, you know, at the right uh, bottom uh, right bottom of your of the screen. So you can you can type your questions, and you know, after our response and so on, we, we can have a live um, uh, discussion. Um, uh, the the well, there's another thing is that the, this event is recorded um, uh, for for future use, uh, but also as a record. Um, so I just wanted to uh, remind you. So good, um, we are going to start uh, now. Uh, um, so um, a few years ago, when I was in London, I had a chance to meet uh, Pat Birmingham. Um, so it was in uh, 2017, and she proposed to me to edit a special issue of Philosophy Today. So basically, it was almost four or five years ago. And um, then in 2018, I proposed to her uh, of a special issue called Philosophy After, Philosophy After Automation. Um, for many reasons uh, that I proposed this subject, uh, Philosophy After Automation, uh, but well, there are many reasons, but maybe I want to single out one. Uh, maybe I want to single out two of them. Uh, first of all, uh, that concerns the relation between philosophy and technology, or more precisely, philosophy and automation. Um, what is the relation between philosophy and automation? Uh, normally, I think uh, for many people, there is no relation, but I think there is a strong relation, and there is a very important relation. 
um, because if uh, philosophy uh, you know aims for um, or certain traditional philosophy uh, has be, has been aiming for uh, for example the question uh, for autonomy and autonomy is also a form of automation or autonomy well, but the relation between autonomy and automation is also a complicated one um, um, the, the, the subject or the object or a key subject of, of philosophy concerning autonomy and, uh, you know, especially after the philosophy of subjectivity and uh, its relation to automation. Um, um, I, I, for me, I think it's a key, um, a key moment in the history of philosophy. Um, uh, and I will explain uh, later. Now, the second uh, motivation is that as a response to what Heidegger once called uh, the end of philosophy, the end of philosophy. So uh, philosophy after automation, you know, after we, but only when we are able to analyze the relation between philosophy and automation, then we are able to respond to the question, what is, uh, um, you know, what comes after, what uh, for philosophy, what comes after automation. And this, this second motivation comes from the reading of, of Heidegger, when Heidegger uh, claims that cybernetics marks the end of the end of philosophy, but also the end of metaphysics for Heidegger. Um, but what does it really mean by that, that uh, cyber, cybernetics marks the end of philosophy? And that philosophy you know, that Heidegger proposed in, in 1964 uh, essay, um, the end of philosophy and the task of thinking in which Heidegger suggests to, you know, basically to, to put philosophy aside, uh, but to think of a new task uh, of thinking or to, to kind of uh, just suppose thinking and philosophy. Um, for me, I think these two motivations or these two rationale are closely related. Uh, and um, um, but this really needs us to look uh, very close into terms such as automation and uh, autonomy. And one of the key threats that I try to analyze, uh, and that was also the the the, the, the core arguments were, uh, when I tried to explain to the contributors um, two three years ago, um, um, is that. I, I think that today, when we think of automation, we still think that we, we still think that autom automation is a kind of a repetition, a mechanistic repetition, like what we have seen, for example, in uh, in um, Charlie Chaplin's film, uh, The Modern Times. You know that the kind of repetitive labor work, then we call it automation, and so therefore it is. It was possible. Uh, to oppose automation with autonomy, not because autonomy is not something is is uh, in opposed automation is not anything that is mechanistic and repetitive, but it's reflexive. There's a, a, a reflexivity in in the concept of autonomy, um, especially when we when we think of, of Immanuel Kant. Um, but it was also the 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 the, the key points uh, or the key moment uh, um, that in the opposition between automation um, and auton and, and autonomy, um, where the, the the concept of automation, as I said before, is very much limited to um, mechanistic uh, and uh, repetitive movement, while autonomy. Uh, is associated with reflection, with reflexivity. Um, and this I called uh, this, this opposition, uh, which we can find, for example, in, in Kant and the, post, and, and the post Kantians, that I try to mark in my introduction to describe this, this, uh, this, this opposition uh, as a, a condition of philosophy or condition of philosophizing. And this was very much based on, uh, on, 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 the, on the opposition between mechanism and organism. 
and or the, the mechanistic and the, or, uh, the organic, which you can find, for example, in Kant, especially in Kant and the critique of judgments and so on, that constitutes, as I claim in the introduction, an, a, an organic condition of philosophizing where we find in Kant's critique of judgments, but also in the post-Kantians work, for example, in Fichte, in Schelling, and in Hegel, each of, uh, each of them um, develop um, their own approach towards the question of the organic or the organismic. And until, um, and, and, until, our into, until the 20th century, where we find also, for example, in Besson, in Kessner, in, um, in, in, in Whitehead, for example. Um, however, this opposition between autonomy and, auto, and automation, you know, autonomy, be, be, uh, the, the, the subject of philosophy, um, and this opposition seems, seems to, well, seems to me, has come to uh, an end, or, or, or even if not coming to the end, it was, uh, was challenged um, in the 20th century. Um, um, by cybernetics, by cybernetics. Um, and this is also a reading, um, you know, um, that my reading of what Heidegger says, that, philosoph that, that uh, cybernetics must the end of philosophy, um, is because I think in that this opposition between, or the opposition between the organic and the double, uh, and, and, and the, and the uh, or the organismic and the and the um, and the mechanistic, or were kind of uh, surpassed by cybernetics, uh, at least according to the claim of cyber of cybernetics. And I want, just want to briefly mention that um, this was addressed by Norbert Wiener in his 1948 uh, cybernetics uh, communication or control in men and uh, animals. Um, in which the first chapter is titled uh, Newtonian and Bersonian time. You know, that Nobel did not try to oppose. On the one hand, uh, kind of, of course, it, we cannot say that Newton is a mechanist, uh, uh, but in, in, the, in, the, in the argument of Nobel Vino, that he tried to oppose uh, a mechanism and vitalism, mechanism and vitalism. Well, of course, vitalism is not necessarily organicism. But by opposing vitalism and, uh, and the mechanism that Norbert Wiener tried to propose that the cybernetic is what resolved this opposition or what made this opposition obsolete. So I, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the introduction, I claim, but also as well as in my book, Recursivity and Contingency, published in 2019, I try to claim that cybernetics enforces a new condition of philosophizing after Immanuel Kant, um, especially his, um, um, you know, according to what I try to, try, try to explain uh, before, the opposition between autonomy uh, automation, uh, organicism, and uh, mechanism. So the, the 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 rise of cybernetics and its further development today, you know, in all forms of automatic or technology of automation, for example, um, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, um, biotechnology, and so on, and nanotechnology, and so on and so forth. Uh, then brings, they bring us or enforce us to enter a new condition of uh, philosophizing. Um, that might be one way uh, to interpret what Heidegger called uh, the end of philosophy. Uh, and this new, so it's, for me, it's not really the end of philosophy per se, but rather the, the kind of uh, the end of a specific more, uh, condition of philosophical thinking. And um, I think today we are in an epoch where we have to address this question, um, uh, namely a new condition of philosophizing that was imposed by, you know, since the, uh, since the end, emergence of cybernetics. And therefore, um, I wanted to ask, to raise this question 
philosophy after automation, uh, what would come or what could come after uh, this history and this analysis of the history of philosophy that I try to outline in the introduction, but also in, 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 my, in, my, in my other works. So, um, and um, I was very happy that uh, you know, uh, many, many, many uh, uh, authors uh, actively respond to the call, and uh, you know, some of us are, are present here today, but several others like Howard Cago, uh, Jean-Luc Nancy, and uh, um, they were not able to, to, to participate today. But um, for those who are interested, uh, well, uh, of course, also Bernard Stiglin, who, who uh, uh, Jean-Luc Nancy and Bernard Stiglin, they, they submit their article while they were all very ill. Um, so I'm, I, I, I have been really grateful for that, uh, for, for, the, for the contributions um, and then uh, died uh, last year, so apparently he couldn't join us. Uh, but, but I think he's with us um, uh, because there's a lot of resonance uh, with uh, his, uh, you know, his, his entire life work. Um, so uh, that would be the, you know, that, that was the, 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 um, the um, idea behind the core of, uh, of this special issue. And uh, so I, I, I have been really happy that, you know, the, uh, the, the contributors have contributed uh, um, or bringing, have brought in very different voices and, 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 and viewpoints and uh, very speculative at the same time also very, very concrete and uh, challenging. However, you know, the subject is huge. Philosophy after automation is uh, too, probably too huge to be handled by, uh, by one special issue. And therefore, that is also the reason that why we're going to have a launch. Uh, you know, for 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 two uh, reasons. One is that we would like to you know exchange with each other, but also you know to 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 to, to make this a very beginning uh, uh, to carry this uh, questioning further, you know, philosophy after automation, and 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 also to 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 to. to um, Think to rethink about the relation between philosophy and automation, and philosophy after automation. So that's my brief introduction. So um, um, maybe I can now we can um, you know give the speech to the uh, to the panelists who would like to say something. I mean uh, to talk about their own contributions or response to uh, to to to. Or if they have any, you know, uh, some new ideas to, to respond to. So I don't know who would like to come first. I know that Pieter has prepared a written <laughs> text. Yeah. Maybe you want to do a jump, jump in first? Yeah, well, my article, well, our interview was not exactly about uh, automation. Well, you know, a little bit. And so I thought, well, let's let's respond to your editorial then. Uh, I didn't have much time, but I prepared something, and uh, yeah, I, I can read it uh, uh, if you want. I hope I'll be able to uh, get it across in, in, in 15 minutes. Um, I can uh, share my screen, right? Yeah. Right. Um, then you can read uh, with me. Uh, yeah, can you see it? Is it, vis is it visible? Yeah, yeah. yeah? Yes, okay. yes. Yeah. Okay, and now can I operate it? Uh, yes, I can. Okay, uh, so this is a, is, is a, a Heideggerian response, let's say, to Hugh's um, uh, uh, editorial. <clears throat> One of the motivations, if not the decisive motivation behind the question that Hugh Huey urges us to ponder, namely that of the fate, the possibility, the task, the challenge, or indeed the issue, the Sache, of philosophy after automation is, of course, the later Heidegger's famous meditation on the end of philosophy and the task of thinking from 1964, in which he argues that the history of philosophy is accomplished today in and as our technological world civilization, and writes that in, in it, philosophy has in fact been replaced by cybernetics, 
understood as the new fundamental science or universal discipline that determines and governs all other sciences or scientific disciplines. These are all unified, as he argues in a lecture entitled on the question of the determination of the issue of thinking given one year later by an all pervasive cybernetic strand that he characterizes by the two notions of information and steering or governance. Although indeed cybernetics is a term hardly used anymore today, it is obvious that it is still that which, albeit by other names, is behind the frenetic imposition of universal and generalized automation and computation that we are involved in nowadays, rapidly progressing to the establishment of what Bernard Stiegler referred to as the automatic society, in which human existence as such is in the process of becoming automated to a maximum extent. Heidegger, for his part, by the way, enigmatically prophesied the coming of what he called the automatic age after the third, mind you, not the second world war, in a note written in the mid 1950s. In our thoroughly technologized society, philosophy is not needed anymore, Heidegger stated, simply because it already lies at its very foundation and is fully integrated in its operation. Thinking though, which is not exhausted for Heidegger by philosophy, is not yet at its end. This necessity, on the contrary, it is or should be on its way to the other beginning. This necessity of the other beginning of thinking is also evoked by Huey, in the editorial introduction to the special issue that we are presenting here, although he understands it in a way that seems quite different from the way Heidegger imagines it. This difference has to do, or so it seems, with the difference in their understanding of technology, which for Heidegger is decidedly ontological or rather ontohistorical, whilst Huey seems to embrace an understanding of technology that anchors it in life, that is to say in human life as characterized by an inventive and exterior exteriorizing intelligence similar to Bergson, but also to Le Roi Gourand's Lotka's, as well as Stiegler's idea of human life as a process characterized by exosomatization or the exteriorization of artifacts. However, Huey's notion of cosmotechnics also makes room for an ontological dimension, albeit in the form of a cosmological a priori, or what he refers to sometimes as a cosmic reality. For Heidegger, the reign of cybernetics is ultimately the reign of and framing as a modality of presencing of being in which it has fallen entirely into oblivion. We can be sure about the absolute future dominance of cybernetics as the informational project of steering and control of the totality of beings, because that dominance is assured by the fact that this steering is itself steered unknowingly and therefore blindly by an imperative or claim that comes from being and not from something inherent to human life, as it were, or indeed from any ontic domain. It is this steering, this ontohistorical meta steering, one might say, that drives the cybernetic urge to plan, calculate, and master all of being. It has its permanently and ever more insistently reigning origin in the Greek beginning of philosophy. When Heidegger therefore talks about the possibility of the other beginning, of the task of thinking after the completion and full integration of philosophy in the cybernetic world that is now entering its stage of generalized automation, he has the thinking of this ontohistorical imperative in mind, which calls us from the very beginning of thinking as philosophy or metaphysics into pursuing ever more exclusively the cybernetic organizing and securing of beings. The wellspring of this imperative is none other than being, or rather the truth of being itself, which was experienced, yet not explicitly thought, at the beginning of philosophy as aletheia, which Heidegger translated, we know, as the unconcealment or also the clearing or the open. This is, in Heidegger's view, the elementary thing or the element, as he also refers to it in his letter on humanism, that demands to be thought by the thinking that least philosophy or metaphysics as realized in today's cybernetic society to itself and opens toward the other beginning. That is to say, by reconnecting to that element as the source of a new questioning, the, question of, the questioning of being as the ever forgotten condition of possibility of encountering beings and thus not simply of the beings encountered in its clearing. This element has been abandoned from the beginning by the technical interpretation of thinking in terms of logic by the Greek metaphysicians. An interpretation that for Heidegger still reigns, indeed reigns supreme at the current closure of metaphysics in the form of cybernetics, and that lies behind both mechanical and organismic thinking 
which in his view are basically the same, as Yui also points out. The author beginning as the task of thinking after the end of philosophy consists for Heidegger thus of trying to become aware again, or for the first time, of what he calls with reference to Goethe, the Ur phenomenon of the clearing or the openness of being in and out of which all cybernetic processes of automation, automatization, as well as disautomatization unfold. It is the task of listening again and becoming attuned again, or actually even for the first time to the ever forgotten silent call of the happening of being as event, as ereignis, a call that humans are now only blindly obeying. The kind of thinking that Heidegger envisions here to return to the question posed by Huey is of a more original nature, it seems to me, than obviously either the mechanistic and organismic forms of thinking that Huey distinguishes as the first and the second stage of modern philosophy, but also more original than the other thinking proposed by Huey in response to the new condition. And it is a new technical condition of what he calls the, calls the organizing inorganic, which is the emerging phase of modern technology in which machines become gigantic organisms in which we live, as he writes in recursivity and contingency, and where the apparatus and environment are becoming organismic, functioning recursively to produce their own structures and patterns. Some well-known contemporary as well as futurist phenomena he associates with this organizing inorganic are artificial superintelligence, the noosphere as the planetary superbrain, synthetic biology, but also transhumanism and the fantasies of the post-human and the homo deus and generally the planetarization of technology in terms of the technosphere. In all these developments, automatisms of all kinds increasingly come to dominate the human domain and are experienced overwhelmingly as an alienating force. This new kind of thinking that is called for by Huey, and tellingly he still calls it a philosophizing, can only struggle against this alienation by assimilating itself to this condition of the organizing inorganic and by working in accordance with it. This sounds quite Stieglerian, of course, and when Yuri refers to the overly famous line by Hölderlin that the saving power can only come from where the danger is, he situates this danger, but also the saving potential in the materializations and immaterializations of the organizing inorganic, that is to say in technology itself, implicitly considered with Stiegler as a pharmacon. Thinking under the new condition of the organizing inorganic should orient itself toward its machines, Yuri writes, in the sense of orienting itself within this concrete danger in order to turn it towards the open. From a Heideggerian perspective though, we may ask whether orienting one's thinking to the machines of the organizing inorganic will ever lead to the open such that it allows to gain a free and truly questioning relation to it and thus to deliver us from our increasing and closeness in the organizing inorganic, that is to say in the automatizing society. As Heidegger insists time and again, all focusing on technology will never arrive at the essence of technology. It cannot even come close then. Indeed, in doing so, thinking only gets captured more and more in its spell while never explicitly experiencing it. For Heidegger, who obviously does not subscribe to what Huey calls the ontological apology of technology and for whom not technology, but ontology remains the first philosophy, the true danger resides in the decisively non-technological Onto-historical essence of technology, not in concrete technology as it manifests around us and appears before our eyes. Instead of focusing, focusing one's attention on the operations of the emerging artificial intelligences that are in the process of reconditioning our lives and bringing them under the control of an all-pervasive automation, we should try, according to Heidegger, to become aware of the ontological meta-drive, a kind of ontological automaticity that drives our drive toward automation and operativity in its non-operational, eventual, or ereignis half way. Um, wait a minute. This meta drive is what Heidegger frequently calls the power of framing, die Macht des Stellens. Since the reign of this power is much more real, seiender, than everything that follows from it, despite being nothing real that we can present to ourselves as it were, Becoming aware of this power so as to gain a certain distance from it has a much greater liberating potential than any enga active engagement with technology, although it will have no noticeable effect on reality, indeed is not effective in any way. 
What is important for Heidegger, the only thing important is that the kind of presence that this power of framing presents to us can and should make presence as such, that is to say being worthy of questioning again, or rather for the very first time. This would be the famous step back before the reign of unframing, so that we may experience ourselves as being called and used through that framing by being, thereby opening the possibility of experiencing our belongingness to being. This is what being still is still waiting for, Heidegger writes in one of his black notebooks, and we still seem as far away from that as ever. Of course, we may want to question Heidegger's longing for the purity of being with Stiegler and also Huey as illusory and contend that any questioning of being is necessarily preceded by a being put in question of humans by technology, indeed conditioned by an empirical technological reality that is the product of a process of exosomatization incessantly traversing the human species, a process that would have been neglected by Heidegger as Dasein's originally artifactual condition. Yet, and with this, I have to end my brief but already too long intervention for today. I continue to be impressed, yet also puzzled by Heidegger's permanent, consistent and unwavering insistence on the non-operational, non-effectual and non-causal and indeed neither organic nor organological character of our relation to technology. That is to its essence as being, which is pointed out again and again on many occasions and in a variety of ways, in particular, at most emphatically in the black notebooks. Technology as being for Heidegger is nothing real next to other realities. It is purely evental. And that means beyond the causal or effectual, without effect, wirkungslos, he writes, free of effect, wirkungsfrei, not in need of effect, wirkungsunbedürftig. In Vigile und Naturno, a collection of remarks from 1952 to 1957, published last year in the Gesamtausgabe, he writes, the presencing of the effectual technology and framing remains the non-effectual, such is the eventual nature of the event. The other beginning, Senzu Heidegger, is therefore also essentially achieved beyond the realm of causality, not something that can be effectuated by an effective philosophizing oriented to our technological beings. Reflecting in 1939 at the brink of the Second World War on the possibility of another beginning, he writes, the human being, and of course this is horrible English, you should <laughs> read this in German, the human being must first set an extremity of the question worthiness of being in opposition to this extremity of the abandonment by being. Indeed, not merely set it in opposition, but actually set it up and venture it from himself and come to surmise something of the essential ineffectiveness of being and its unneediness for effectivity. Now are such ponderings indeed, as Peter Sloterdijk suggested in Rules for the Human Park, totally obsolete and pointless, concluding figures of reflective thought and figuren des besinnlichen denkens, as he called them there. If we have to acknowledge that the clearing of being is not the element or the ur phenomenon that Heidegger thought it to be, but is always technologically conditioned? I leave this question for now and want to finish with suggesting that Yui's project of cosmotechnics and planetary thinking as possible openings towards a philosophy after automation should not only consider the questions of techno diversity and no diversity, but also that of onto diversity and not only in dialogue with current anthropology's ontological turn, but also again with Heidegger's question of being, which is not yet exhausted as far as I'm concerned. Well, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, thank you for this uh, very well prepared response. Uh, um, because in the, in, the, in, the, in the special issue, there is a contribution uh, from Peter, uh, where actually that is, uh, uh, that's the dialogue between us on on, on, on the landscape of philosophy of technology today. But he um, generously responds from a, a Heideggerian point of view on, on, on this uh, uh, to directly to my call. Um, well, I don't know if, if, if this is the best time for me to respond to, to you, probably not, but I, I think uh, um, you know, especially the question of, of, of diversity um, 
and 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 more specifically the question of being uh, what what really does it mean by being and uh, the, the the long due discussion um or the kind of debate in the 20th century uh, on if 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 in asia thought there is a question of being at all you know through the work of of um, of uh, François Julien or, um, or, or, or Nishida, for example, but, but maybe we can uh, come back to, to, to this debate later. Um, yeah, sure. I, I don't know if anyone, you know, the panelist or the, attend, or the attendee, anyone of you would like to also to, to raise questions to Kirtan. Huh? Or the response to the response of uh, Peter. There is a question by yeah. Jeff now. Um. Um, well, I th if I understand the question, um, I. Th well, maybe they're not exactly opposed, but uh, can you hear me? So I, but I don't know actually, uh, do, uh, do, can everyone uh, read the question? Yeah, I don't know. Well, yeah, okay. You, you, should, you, should, go, you should go to the, to the q and I think. Yeah, 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 everyone can read the question. So, uh, so you, uh, the, the question is basically you oppose ontolo the ontological and the organological. Yeah, I think I think there is a conditioning relation uh, for, for Heidegger. Uh, technology is that which that which proceeds from a, a certain uh, understanding of being, right? And for Stiegler, there is only being. There is only a question of being or or horizon of being, because humans are uh, put into question by being or are traumatized uh, by uh, a technological system or by a pharmacological situation. So there is an ontic. Uh, conditioning of the ontological uh, in in Stiegler, and I think that he makes that uh, very clear in, uh, in in Technics and Time, but also in the introduction of Technics and Time too. So I think that's one of the the basic critiques of Stiegler uh, on uh, on Heidegger's let's call it ontocentrism. Um, is that a, a an answer to your question yet, Mo? Um, well, maybe I give one, just add one point in that. I don't, uh, uh, I, I, I wouldn't think that it is opposed. What? I, I, no. I think that there is a relation of, uh, it's an oppositional relation, uh, but all but like what you said, uh, a, a condition, or maybe we can even say a mutual condition, a reciprocal relation between between being and, and, and techniques in the sense as like what you said before you know, because certain um, there is a close relation between technology and, and the question of being but also yeah. more specifically is uh, that very much based on the ontological difference between Zion and Zionist. Mm -hmm. uh, and for Stigler, that the access to being, to design, could only be conditioned by, uh, by, 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 by technology. So, um, uh, and, and I think that is very clear uh, in, in the presentation of Pierre. So I don't think that it is really uh, oppositional, even though uh, one could develop a reading that Stigler's concept to the question of technology or his concept of technology uh, is derived from Zionism, but which I don't think it's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a correct. Yeah, but what what, what that there is an ungedachte in Heidegger, right? And the ungedachte is the tertiary retention, or the the that as well as that with uh, which allows Dasein uh, its access. Uh, you know, to its own past, and 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 also allows it to project itself in, into its future. Right. So there is a, and and you could say that Heidegger's history of being is is, is conditioned by by writing technology, to, to to put it very simply, right. So there is, it's not an opposition, but uh, Stiegler tries to think an unthought 
een, een, tick, een ontik een, een fout in, uh, in, right. in Heiger. So. But I would say that you know that is also the gen the, the approach of the consumption. <laughs> that yeah. the this is the the, the, concept, the concept is the, uh, method. Yeah, but what is interesting is 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 this this whole question of the the non-operational. I think uh, I, I did not have the time, of course, in in this article, but I think we have to um, confront this with Stiegler's uh, late thinking of the quasi-causal. I think that the concept of quasi-causality is an attempt uh, to think what Heidegger thought in terms of being. That, that's my, my hunch, <laughs> in a way. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think, I think it's, uh, well, that's, that's a very complicated. I mean, if that's I a very complicated time, question. Yeah. If you're going to have time, just then I would love to jump into this. Uh, yeah. But let's see if there's any other direct question for you. Um, um, right, so. There's another question. No, oh, no, there's no other question. So I don't know if any, any, anyone you know, from the panel or, or any other uh, person would like to raise a question now. Or, um, if no, maybe we can pass to, 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 to another speaker and then we come back to, you know, to response to, uh, to, 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 the, to the response of, of Pieta later. So, um, who, who would like to to come uh, after Peter? Michal, would you like to? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so maybe um, a woman, a woman first. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hello. <laughs> No. Anna Katrina. or Babette? <laughs> Katrina, no, 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 not me. I meant let's switch genders a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or Anna or Babette? I don't know if you. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. I'm happy to speak. Yeah. I have a, yes. I have a small small PowerPoint, which might be distracting for the moment, and that can always be helpful, I think, sometimes. I, I don't have a prepared, but I will just present a text which is, in fact, based on the article so that I contributed and for which I'm extraordinarily grateful to be a part of, because it's exciting. There's also, and this was so exciting, what, uh, what you begins with for me, because this question of autonomy and the very complicated dynamic, it's almost a kind of metonymic metaphoricity between autonomy and the automatic is part of a talk I'll be giving next week. Not next, well, almost, now. I'll be making it next week because they want pre-recorded versions of it. It's all automated. Uh, in Lille, I won't be there, flat. Uh, revisiting the man in the white suit. So you see kind hearts and nanotech. And that's actually the real point, I think, of what we should be talking about, but none of us will be talking about. Um, and that's related to how things really work. They work on the level of folding, unfolding, and they are automatic. There's no machine involved. And so what's, I started in biology. So the, the interesting kind of question of what a machine is at that level will be what I'll be taking up. But right now, just the theme, necropolitics, and you see it also behind me, and technoscotosis, and that's new modes. Now, I spent years writing my dissertation many billions of years ago in, Lou in Louvain-la-Neuve, uh, and that means also, because there's nothing in Louvain-la-Neuve, uh, in Brussels. And so there you have a wonderful connection with other people, people who are not just one's own kind. And that means Belgians, and people ignore Belgians kind of a lot. One of them is Paul Autley. Everyone here, I think, will know his work. There's no way not to. And his Mondanium, as it's called. Because right now, metaphorically, literally, we're there. We're in this Mondanium. We are in this world projected in our mind, which we constitute. And we're doing that. And Baudrillard, who's influenced, of course, being French, about this, and Baudrillard being French, does not say who influences him. It's kind of a rule in France. Never mention the most important people, and everyone is expected to figure it out. The trouble is, Americans and the English never bother, so you never know. 
And that means we're still in that system, complex system. And behind all of that in 1948, another respected, but disrespected if you speak French, Swiss theorist writes mechanization takes command, probably the most important, and that's what Yuk was talking about, and Jolie Chaplin, but also what we're still living with and what Heidegger means when he talks about this idea of Ackerbau and the idea of what is agriculture and how it functions, and it functions precisely in a mechanized fashion to this day. This, of course, would be Les Halles. That's how that functioned at the time, a long time ago. Uh, it's a little bit less elegant today, but it still has the same effect. All behind that is an ancestor of the George Bush that we know, Viniva Bushes, as we may think, who decides. The same thing that's happening right now as we speak in Washington and in Paris and in Berlin for individuals who are saying, how the hell can we use this lockdown for the future? And Vannevar Bush wanted to know how to use the war effort that produced the atom bomb, which enabled them at the last moment, possibly, to bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki as the Japanese were negotiating a surrender just in time. And that, of course, is the same thing. That's the Mimex, which Vannevar Bush stole from Otle, cancelling Otle forever so he would not be mentioned anymore. And we would talk about the Mimex and the meme that we talk about to this day. So the, that same idea, le livre sur le livre, is, of course, what Otle is trying to reflect on. And it is what we're doing now, projecting and inventing books we do not have by trying to remember books we could have via a PDF, which is not the same. There, that's the great reference. This is the key reference to this day. If you mention this, I tried to do this in a talk at Geneva and all of the neuroscientists there, because it's a very analytic department said, no way, no one does cybernetics anymore. It's passé, forby, no longer relevant. And of course, unless you're Sloterdijk, you're not reading McCulloch. That's a very interesting thing to this day. I met when I was there, I lived there for many years with Tracy Strong, who's also here at this conference in San Diego, Werner Winge. Werner Winge writes science fiction for a living, but he's also responsible for the language of the singularity. And people who write science fiction turn out to be hugely influential, make it up, invent it, and the world will respond to your imagination. It's kind of magic how that works. And that's where we are. So the censoring and shadow banning is also how some of the things that we don't see, there'd be an answer, if I could have answered to what Peter was saying, to Heidegger, because Heidegger is a very, very complicated thing. We can take too, too literally, too ontically this ungedachtes, but it can also be something else, everything that you don't see. What we're seeing right now is precisely what George Orwell would have loved, everything you're allowed to see, everything you're not allowed to see. Behind that, Twitter and Facebook and so on, will be the apps which do not need to see your face to identify you. The most identifiable part of you, everyone knows this who's watched a horror movie, you just have to gouge out the person's eyes and then you'll be able to enter any secure facility because it's not your mouth and your nose what interests a person. If you're Lacan, you want the smile, you want the face, you want everything that we can give in our face to one another. Just a split second, all those many muscles, machines don't need that. All they need are your eyes. And of course, that we're very cooperative now, we help them. We help them track us perfectly, beautifully. We wear the mask. And so it makes, because machines have limitations, they can't deal with extra noise. It bothers them. So we cooperate. In a text a long, long time ago that I gave in the presence of Kurzweil, I took some pictures and those are cool because uh, he was younger then, but who knows with this technology if he's not still a young. Uh, on this idea of transhumanism, where, not Charlie Chaplin, I appreciate the reference I mentioned, but Slang. For me, the most exciting thing, I paid 50 bucks to be able to publish this, is in fact, Stanley Harris's great science for scientists, because you have all of your equations and, and you have all of your equations, and then you have the missing link, so you say, ungedactus, so you say, miracle, so you say, contingency, something. I've recently finished, I'm about to get proofs for Gunther Anders' philosophy of technology. They took my subtitle, The Wretches, but that's okay. What I try to do there is talk not only about Simondon, who's the hot stuff today, uh, and Jacques Ellul, who used to be, but no one quotes him anymore, uh, important as he is, or no one quotes, and everyone should read 
Louis Basso, who writes beautifully on Toxion Technique, a science experimental, who really explains how everything functions from the start. And that is part of our Ungedachtes. Scotosis. Now, scotosis is, is, is a theological word, and I accidentally took courses in theology, and that means I learned something about that as part of my immersion in continental philosophy, which is the wrong kind of philosophy, because today, anyone who does continental philosophy is analytic, because that's all there is. Uh, so we just have that, even when we do our reflections and so on. But if you go through what Heidegger was talking about, this reference to Kant, you're going back to something that might help that strange notion of the schematism. It exists in French, it's not important. But what Heidegger brings in for what he's talking about includes obviously Zimmel, Jaspers when he was young, of course, and you would therefore have very, very good arrangements of what's going to be crucial, most important, Junger. No one likes to talk about him, but is an important person. There's Alexander for no good reason, to bring in, if you want to also bring in unforgotten names, and they're remembered because everyone talks about Ivan Illich, but at the same time, he is despised along with Fleck. Now, why do you need Fleck? You need Fleck because A, he was a scientist, B, he talks about how to resist, resist when you need to resist and what none of us are doing. That's one of the interesting things about philosophers today is how little we do what we think Heidegger should have done. That's kind of a shocking thing. We don't do it. But in this nice popular novel, the other scientist, the one who's not named Dr. Wiegel gets the, rep, the, the title ref, but it's Fleck who's the other scientist. The milieu interior, which is of course really key for understanding Stiegler, comes from Claude Bernard, who invents it in biology and he gets it, he develops it on the basis of, and to this day in biology, to this day, you will go and collect dogs on the street who come from families because they don't know what you're going to do to them. And that's very, very important. So the family dog is the ideal creature to experiment on because he thinks you might still be kind. That leads to what is for uh, the, the notion of milieu is this idea of a homeostasis. And of course, it is a constantly changing set up the cybernetics, there's our Stiegler and digital humanities, there's all the text and and I have this wonderful text, the question concerning technology in China, which of course all of us should be reading and that is part of this question of this. And this word for those people who are wondering where scotosis comes from uh, is this term, Bernard Lonergan, who uses the term to refer to what you deliberately refuse to see. My own title was only about this strange word, technoscotosis, to illuminate, to illuminate this term that refers to what will obviously refer to the necropolitical. And we are living in it in a very, very different way. If you wanted to, you could read it a little bit further. You're already doing it all the time, especially in lockdown. That is to say, you are using dating apps and those apps locate you for lots of friends and purposes, but you're there. We also did this in order to join this particular seminar. And that puts you to a certain extent in terms and on the level of surveillance appropriation. The better title for my book, The Hallelujah Effect, is the porn effect. And one of the reasons for that is because pornography, since we human beings began to be human, is the way that we are not where we are and where we mean to be. And that means fantasy, ideal, Zizek cursing on Minitel, which is, of course, what that was. So that particular point, and this will take us, and I will want to be stopping here in just a moment, automatic speech, which is cursing, this way of talking that is all by yourself works because, and you can read that text, it is a way, it's also how you cast a spell if you happen to be a witch uh, or, a, or a warlock is done by bad language. But it's also something that we learned and saw in Great Dexter, uh, but also this particular language, which is the way one talks and shows how smart one is by not following any particular rules. That same thing falls into what Bruno Latour writes about in his book, which no one seems to want to be reading against vaccination, which is called Pasteur Grippe de Microbe, about all of that. All of that refers to what Nietzsche says. This is his text, tiny aphorism, the stink press, 
talk about automation and autonomy again, trains and the telegraph. It is a conclusion Nietzsche argues extended over a thousand years. And Nietzsche's statement is, it is of course, a thousand year conclusion noch niemand zu ziehen gewagt hat. So no one has managed to draw what follows from something we've had, not just recently, not since Otley, not since Vinnie Warbusch, but really since the 19th century. It's a thoroughly 19th century problem. There we are, where we are today in this day of sex machina, we need to believe in the sciences. And that word belief is where we stand. I'm going to uh, stop that now because there's a text that's more than the text, but you can perhaps have a question or not as the case may be. And there's also other panelists. So thank you for that attention. And also thank you to all of you because I think the contributions are so great that I will be using this volume, this issue for the class I'm teaching this summer technology well, thank you very much for the for the for the for the presentation and uh, also for the for this uh, amount of huge amount of references that you give to everyone to read <laughs> um, um, I mean just very briefly I think I think that uh, um, I think I, I mean I completely I agree with you the fundamental uh, role of cybernetics and that how it has been ignored um, as you said, that the uh, um, that that, the, that your colleague said, you know, it's 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 already already the past, it's already forby. But um, in fact, I think we are uh, um, more than ever in the epoch of cybernetics. And um, those references that you you know uh, of of Simon Don of Jacques Ellu, uh, these are all great readers of. Um, of cybernetics, not to mention that there is a, there is a strong link between uh, Claude Bernard to Walter Cannon and to Ashby, for example. So, uh, thank you very much for this, uh, uh, you know, for this episode that reminds us that there's still a lot of uh, work to be done and uh, many perspectives that we can use to understand uh, better the situation uh, of today. So I don't know if you, if any, uh, you know, other panelists or the, uh, or, or the public would like to respond to, or to pose questions. I saw there's one from Peter, but it's not a, a response to that. Um, is there any questions or or, or, or response? Yeah, maybe just a remark. You you, you mentioned Ernst Junger. I'm 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 quite a fan of Ernst Junger. Uh, I, I must say he, he reads lovely. I I I, I love his uh, novels and his uh, diaries, etc. It's very. But uh, you didn't mention Friedrich Georg. That was uh, the Junger's brother, uh, who wrote uh, I think a much more interesting book on philosophy. Uh, I forgot the title at the moment. It's much more interesting than the Arbeiter. I think Heidegger did not. Uh, give a course on that, uh, remarkably. But um, why is he missing in the in the in your parade? <laughs> well, there were so many names that are missing, <laughs> and one of the things that I have spent years trying to do is to get people to talk about a different set of names. And what everyone always does is go back to Junger and say, "Let's talk about him again." So, one of the things we didn't do, you will note that in my presentation, I said Louis Basso. Now. You have to be an old fashioned philosopher of science like myself to even know who he is or to know why he matters. He matters before Bachelard. He matters before an entire French tradition, but he is a, he's an experimentalist. He's someone who does it. And it's one of the things that one needs to know when we imagine that the new technologies that are used require a different kind of automation than we understand. And that is that that great question of what we think, and that was that that was the question with, and I'm going to be thinking about this for a long time, with which you began, to me very, very important. How do we understand what it means for some for automation? I don't think we're good at thinking that yet. And I think it is part of thinking the cybernetic and it is also elusive to think about. So I think Heidegger is aware of the two young, younger brothers. I know he was. Yeah. Um, yeah. What he chooses to write on has to do with, I think, I remember Gunter Figal when I was a 
when I was a visiting professor in Tübingen, had this giant picture of Jünger in his office. I think it was for aesthetic reasons that Ernest Jünger is quoted <laughs> in, in, and that philosophers love him so much, especially male philosophers, because he's just their ideal of what, of what you should look like. And so you couldn't walk into his office without in, in the Borsagasse without looking at Jünger. Uh, and of course the brother, everyone would then say, of course the brother. You know? So I would say, of course the brother <laughs> should be there. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> right, uh, thank you. Um, so um, I, I, I think you know, we can always come back to, to the discussion at the end. And um, so um, well, everyone, I think it will take time to digest what you just said and uh, all these references. So why do we pass to uh, another speaker and then we come back to at the end. Uh, any, 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 well, I think it, it's, it's, uh, it's up to you who would like to come. Um, I mean, I, I think we, we, didn't, we didn't talk about the order, but that's also not a problem. <laughs> Katarina or, or Anna or Michal? Or... Katarina, do you want to do? Yeah, please. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> I intervened previously <laughs> in the order of presentation, so now I'm called out. Um, okay, so I guess I should uh, briefly talk about my own contribution um, instead of commenting on the entire issue. Uh, Peter did some of that commenting and uh, Babette in some way. Uh, now, talking about my uh, contribution, I guess I should present uh, my positionality, my location. Uh, I have this issue today with <laughs> with locations. Uh, you know, where is uh, the Skopje? Where am I? So this is the most so southern part of what used to be socialist Yugoslavia. So I, I'm there and it's north of Greece. That's geographically where I am. As for the spelling of the name, we explained that now for uh, about the philosophical positionality. Uh, I'm departing there in uh, this reading of mine of Marx, essentially, uh, with the method uh, preferred by Francois Laruel. So another unusual uh, positioning or location. Uh, this uh, method of uh, reading Marx in a, um, this method proposed by Laurel of uh, reading uh, Marx would be called, uh, according to Laurel, a scientific method of uh, approaching Marx's text. So, what Laurel um, uh, supplies us with, uh, furnishes our approach with, is essentially a, a method. Uh, uh, very often uh, Laurel's approach to Marxism uh, being non-philosophical Marxism is shortened uh, into non-Marxism. It's very often called non-Marxism, which raises a lot of confusion actually, uh, as it is uh, understood in the opposite way of what is intended to mean. And it, it, it intends to mean Marx or Marxism without philosophy or non-philosophical treatment use of uh, Marxist conceptual apparatus. Um, so uh, that is the uh, my positionality vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Marxist text and how I operate with it, with it uh, in this discussion of the question of the automaton um, without reducing the discussion to uh, Marxism, but perhaps making ultimately a Marxian argument, because my argument there is that um, one, not one, not we, at least I, I feel I have to make uh, uh, 
a, an, uh, a materialist argument, argument. Being a Marxian, I don't think any other option for myself, at least. And those who adhere to the, the Laruelian, not so much appropriation, rather treatment of Marxist text, I don't see any other uh, option for us but to uh, produce an account with, which would be essentially uh, materialist. So that is what I tried to do in that paper. So uh, the main thesis uh, there is the following and in fully develop, uh, developing this thesis, I must say, I have been aided by uh, Yuke's own uh, writing. Uh, the book uh, Contingency and Recursivity has helped a lot in the following. And uh, that is, so the following is, uh, my argument that, that this opposition between mechanicity and organi uh, organicity is in, in fact false. This is a false opposition. The one feeds into the other, basically. That's the uh, core of my argument there. Uh, I um, draw on what I have learned thanks to uh, so Syrian structuralist uh, linguistics uh, mainly, uh, which is one of uh, the useful things I have studied in my life next to uh, philosophy and classics. Uh, so uh, the so Syrian argument, argument there, and the so Syrian foundation for structuralist linguistics, and perhaps taken further uh, the Lacanian account on uh, the automaton of signification. So both of them are uh, taken there as uh, um, case, uh, cases of, uh, or uh, let's say models, models of uh, signification to be studied in order to prove uh, uh, the, the argument, uh, um, my thesis there in the paper that what is being produced through the automata of signification. So now I'm talking about the automata of signification, such as language, any language, spoken languages, that, that does not necessarily have to mean um, artificial languages, but uh, going further into the discussion, uh, one sees that the, there is in fact no uh, difference in how it is materially produced. Now I'm talking about the, the material aspect and act of producing signs. Uh, uh, the material act of sign making of signification. There, I identify a process that I would call uh, essentially uh, a mechanical process. Like you, you leave a trace. It could be a phonetic trace. If we go to Saussure's course on general linguistics, it could be a phonetic trace. You, 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 you. you you leave a trace, you leave a mark, you create a sign, and it exists only on the basis of uh, the opposition created by the neighboring sound. Uh, and now uh, there, I argue that we must not philosophize this uh, binarism, this duality, or romanticize it philosophically by arguing that you know this other sign is the other the big other let's just not project uh any relationality uh uh intersubject in, uh, let, let's not mime the intersubjective uh relations uh between humans when we talk about this process and actually treat c the other sign, uh, I'm still talking uh, uh, about the example taken from Caesarean linguistics, and see the opposition of this, the other sign as merely uh, an act 
or the, uh, the, the force of an opposition. It does have, phonetically speaking, just that role to be uh, the hemong uh, uh, that you talk, uh, talks about in his uh, book, by the way, on, on the chapter on uh, shelling. So this is, and this limit that is, uh, that is um, creative, that is productive, and in this dynamics of actually uh, sign and its opposition being the real that the other sign produces for the per, uh, first sign. So uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the first phoneme. So this interaction is, you know, one could say mechanical. Uh, there is mechanicity there. But this mechanicity, just as in computer languages, also in natural languages, does not prevent us for acts such as recursivity that treats contingency in a certain way, way and comes into it. It's the same in phonetics, uh, kind of sublates it, let's say, and produces another next level uh, of um, simply another level of uh, signification. And therefore, uh, the one, uh, if we imagine here a structuralist, let's say, um, automaton of signification, so a structure, if we uh, imagine this structure, this branching out happens, or this enrichment of layers of signification, it could be uh, graphically imagined in, uh, or spatially imagined in so all sorts of way, uh, they, they branch out. So you have this on the material level, you have this virtually mechanistic um, act of sign production. Whereas on the other hand, uh, it operates organically as all automata do, in fact. So it appears that uh, now is a good time to ask certain philosophical question, uh, questions uh, around automation. And this issue is therefore very uh, timely and uh, all of the contributions are actually very important as they kind of dispel this old dichotomies that we have inherited from philosophy. We kind of spontaneously drag them with uh, you know, discussions of, uh, tech, on technology or on automation. Uh, yeah, spontaneously in an unexamined way, uh, old philosophical atavisms that it is, uh, that is, I think it is perhaps time to, you know, question, examine thoroughly, including uh, the oppositions uh, of the old kind, like, I don't know, is really, uh, you know, mechanicity and organicity something opposed? Haven't we had in the history of philosophy a mechanistic treatment of nature? Uh, understanding of nature, as well as understand, understanding of ma machines, can we not have uh, a, an organistic uh, approach to the machines as, uh, as much as to nature? Is really nature something opposed to technology? and to the intellectual, is there the old uh, materialism, idealism opposition uh, nesting in this assumption that, you know, intelligence uh, completely, completely excarnate uh, could function without any material support? Is this an old uh, metaphysical phantasm and do we still needed can we uh, can science support the relevance of this phantasm uh so i argue the opposite uh, of course and i try to demonstrate the opposite in my piece there but 
I'm not asking here for, for a consensus on, on this matter. Uh, my point is that uh, one ought to thoroughly uh, examine these questions uh, nowadays, but uh, instead of uh, shedding always, you know, when science and technology on the, on the one hand and philosophy on the other hand are in, dial in, are in dialogue, we always shed the light of philosophy onto the sciences. Maybe we should, you know, assume a certain parallax view on the matter and finally ask the light of sciences to shed uh, upon the questions asked uh, by philosophy and see if they still hold. I mean, do all of these oppositions really hold? As I said, mechanicity, organicity, I precisely, uh, and Hugh's uh, book is actually a good proof to that. That's actually precisely to, through uh, com computer sciences that we kind of, uh, are able to extrapolate a certain, I would call it metaphysics. In my case, it's a good thing, uh, non-philosophically used. So he extrapolates a certain, okay, let's not upset him with this word metaphysics, uh, a certain philosophical uh, apparatus, uh, uh, instrumentarium, a set of concepts and sheds them on his reading of German uh, idealism. So I think that uh, it is time, yeah, to, to kind of change the glance in this way. And that's what I attempt to do in my paper there. And I argue essentially that most of these oppositions do not in fact work and I do not, uh, especially in the current context of uh, technological development. And I do not see the opposition of, you know, nature, body, materiality, and technology, science, reason, in the old classical way. Quite to the contrary, I see a continuity there. And the continuity uh, I consider in the paper is subjected to uh, this very examination, um, I, pre I spent the, the most of my intro presenting, um, whether one should and could decouple mechanicity and organicity in the considerations of automata that we find both in nature, certainly natural languages, and of course in artificial languages uh, as well. And yeah, just one final point, um, uh, the automaton that uh, Marx discusses in, uh, in Grundrisse uh, is not in fact the machines that he's cr criticizing uh, there in, uh, and this critique could be likened to, you know, what we see in modern the modern times and in Chaplin's uh, movie, he is actually talking there about the automaton of value production of capitalism as a system, so political economic system, a system of social relations that is a system of value production. So it's more comparable to uh, a Saussurean or Lacanian notion of the automaton than you know the machines and as means of production. Certainly he talks of machines as well there, but he says there are machines and uh, there is human labor that is the living linkage of uh, between this machinic parts uh, and um, the value production. And it uh, in overall, it creates this huge uh, gigantic automaton of, of capitalism basically. Uh, therefore, he, he says the problem there of the insertion of you know, human labor as merely an element uh, in, in this mas machine of value production, uh, a, a living linkage uh, between other machines and other forms of human labor, wage labor. So uh, I would say that, yeah, that's how it's discussed there. In Grundrisse, and that's how I discuss it in my paper for 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 this uh, issue. So I hope I did not 
exceed my time limit. I'll wrap up here. <laughs> okay, uh, thank, you, thank you very much. Um, um, I think actually there is a confusion in the, from the uh, message uh, there. Uh, well, there are actually so many questions already. Um, uh, there's a, a comment says that recursivity is not about opposition, but about the repetition of the same. I think it's on the uh, not on the not on the Q and A, but on the chat. You should speak to that, don't you think? Yeah. So so yeah yeah maybe I could try to you know clarify this uh, this uh, this um, this point, but I think that what what uh, Katarina was saying is that the you know the because the word is basically taken from what I said that. Um, that um, that I trying to show, you know, as what Peter has already said on my behalf, that I try to characterize that there was a shift in the history of uh, thought, which is from mechanism to organism, and this took place in the nineteenth in the eighteenth century towards the end of eighteenth century. Therefore, this opposition uh, is also the condition of the further development of philosophical thought up to Immanuel Kant. Um, and in the, I, 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 I use recursivity and contingency, and I think you are right. You know, recursivity means the repeat, where it's not really the repetition of the same, but it's a kind of, uh, it's, a, a, um, it's a kind of um, a movement to go back to itself in order to determine itself. So, 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 so it's not a mechanistic repetition, but that is a, a, a process of returning to itself where it is open to contingency and that I use it to characterize the organismic thinking or the thinking about the organism as opposed to, to, to mechanism. That was something dominant in the, where we could really identify this as a common thread in, uh, the, in certain reading of German idealism but also in the further development. So but what Katarina was saying is that this opposition between mechanism and organism may be false uh, or maybe not necessary. And in the text, in, in her text, she actually provide a, a different method, which, which uh, from, she quoted the, uh, from La Ruelle, the, uh, the radical diet of the non-human or in terms of Marx, the third party perspective, in order to think of, a, to look at the, 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 the question of automation from a non-anthropocentric point of view, but also to ask, you know, to think about the future of philosophy beyond what she said, uh, you know, beyond the opposition between the postmodernist uh, extensionism, you know, there's going to be the sixth extension that we are going to, all, all, all going to disappear, and the romantic existentialism. So that's, a, you know, she provides a, a different perspective to look at this, this opposition between, between uh, mechanicity and organicity. But that, that, that is my reading, <laughs> my understanding of, your, of what, you, what, you, what, you has, uh, what you have written and, 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 uh, and, and told us. I don't know if you wanted to uh, add. You want to add something, uh, Katerina? We couldn't hear you. Um, uh, Katerina, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. I just uh, messaged you. Uh, uh, I'm frozen. <laughs> I cannot open the mic. That's um, okay. <laughs> okay, now it's done. You know troubles with technology right. uh, uh okay uh, yes uh, the interpretation is of course uh correct it, it was a, a very accurate that, that that was my argument in the paper and uh yeah uh what your response is correct that, that's why the question confused me because i was in a way presenting my reading of uh, you and 
I was confused me as to whom it is addressed to. Uh, so I was assuming that, you know, you might need to respond to that. Yes, that is uh, what I'm saying there. And that is how I read uh, Yuk's uh, book, Yuk's uh, argument there. The opposition is, uh, of course, uh, false uh, between mechanicity and organicity. Uh, but what he uh, explains about recursivity is the following, that uh, there is, uh, of course, it is repetitive. It's supposed to be a repetition of the same, but there is also an act of sublation of what is contingent, uh, contingent, what might be considered an anomaly and included in a way that makes sense uh, going further in, in the process. Um, so I would say that uh, this kind of uh, sheds light on to uh, this crux of uh, you know, the false uh, opposition I'm talking about. If I understand and read you correctly, you, I don't know if you have anything to add to what I just explained. No, I don't have, I don't have, uh, uh, I don't have to, to, to add to that. So, uh, um, but I think that I saw that there are quite, uh, there are quite some questions. Um, and, uh, and I think that is, uh, 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 actually, I think it's uh, Tracy, Tracy would like to ask you a question. Should we, uh, Uh, but anyway, I don't, I don't, I don't see any response. Um, right. For him, is that he would like to speak, and there's no way he can speak. He says. Yeah. Hello, but I, sh I think uh, I think she's there, but she couldn't. He should, if he can, but he he just finds no way to to be able to speak, and he does. He's not typing. His question. He could come upstairs and ask it. No, here. I think we, we we already have allowed uh, allowed to come in. So um, okay. Yeah, but uh, I, I don't know what. Uh, but anyway, so why maybe 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 uh, uh, Tracy has to. Uh, Tracy is uh, a boy, but <laughs> Tracy is boy. I'm really sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. No one is perfect. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't heard your voice. I am. Um, uh, yeah, we, we let you in already, but um, yeah. He, 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 has, he, has no, he has no unmute button, but he is walking upstairs and <laughs> therefore we are doing this a very technological method, the technique of walking, which is a kind of automatic motion. It's right. a controlled fall. So here he is. Uh, but okay, maybe maybe we we'll pick up the. Maybe we can pick up the questions at the end because yeah, yeah. Anna needs to speak yeah, and Miguel right, right, as well. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's go to the to. Uh... Oh, maybe this. Ah. Okay. Sorry. I just just I had no mute or unmute button downstairs. I'm not sure why. I don't think you ever let me in. <laughs> I wanted. Excuse me. I wanted to ask a question, which I hope brings the last two talks together. Uh, the notion of scotosis is a notion of a kind of blindness to something. A technoscotosis is of course, a blindness to techno. Now, if you go to the Marx discussion we just had, Marx at one point in Capital refers to uh, uh, workers as becoming, under conditions of capitalism, an appendage to a machine, yeah. which seems to me to have a great deal to do with the notion mm -hmm. of technoscotosis. And so the question I would have for both of the last two speakers is, how does one recognize that one has become an appendage to a machine? Because if scotosis is the characteristic of blindness to that, mm -hmm. what is there to do in relationship to that? And one of the things that, seems to me that Babette was doing is trying to give us a whole range of people 
that one would have to look at in order to be able to unpack the question of blindness. So how does one recognize that one has become an appendage to a machine under conditions of the contemporary society? Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, should I go first and then Peter? Yeah, uh, I guess. Um, now the uh, Marxist argument uh, uh, is that human labor is basically estranged, uh, uh, rendered abstract, uh, not uh, in the sense what one would you know uh, discuss uh, in terms of I don't know uh, uh, neo rationalism or. Uh, let uh, we must leave those uh, discussion aside. It has a very particular, very specific uh, um, political uh, meaning. So he's talking about the estrangement of human labor uh, from its product, the estrangement of the worker from his uh, or their uh, uh, work, uh, and this alienation is a problem because uh, the uh, uh, waged labor uh, is rendered basically currency, what is subject to exchange in a system of a completely abstract self-sustaining automaton of uh, a, a value exchange. So, uh, our work, our waged work, serves to this self-sustaining automaton of uh, pure value production in the context of uh, capitalism. That automaton is self-sufficient. So uh, you have um, here also the problem of estrangement of human production of productivity that can include and does include technology as well so production of tools operation with tools uh, but uh, what uh, what makes them um, estranged through capital or through capitalism is that they are in service of uh, uh, surplus value. Because if you remember the formula in Marx, MCM, uh, money, commodity money, uh, money, he argues that this uh, formula is very quickly reduced to M to M prime. So even commodity is expunged from the uh, formula. And what we get at the end is value producing value or value, value producing extra surplus value. So it's, you know, as if self-serving -serve tautology of abstracted value. So uh, something that can be monetarized, of course, uh, rendered uh, money, but completely detached from the reality of human productivity, uh, from uh, which is uh, something that is, um, you know, not to be surpassed in uh, the communist uh, society, uh, according to Marx. We, we should not dream of a society uh, after or without work. If we read, uh, well, um, uh, many texts, but even if we read the, the, the manifesto, that is clear. Uh, so what, what, where it goes is a non-estranged uh, human uh, productivity. Um, so uh, there lies the problem of human labor constituting mere linkage in the automaton of uh, value production and machines and human uh, uh, labor or uh, 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 waged human laborer uh, are uh, just elements of this automaton of estranged, estranged value production. So uh, that is uh, what is being problematized and that uh, by, by Marx and that aspect of estrangement of alienation is uh, uh, identified as uh, the key problem in uh, 
capitalism and of course the problem of its reification but that's quite another topic and a and a long uh, and a long one so uh, let's just drop it for for the moment if there is time i'll, I'll expound on that further. right so thank you very much i think we probably can come back to this uh, because i also have a, a lot of things to say about this question that um because I think what you know in your talk and also the question there's the key question of epistemology and, and, and that we didn't yet uh, discuss the mm -hmm. question of epistemology or mechanism to organ to organicism but also the uh, masses to epistemology um, but maybe we should move to to Anna uh, uh, now and then uh, we we see how it goes <laughs> right. Thank you, Luke. Uh, thank you for organizing this meeting and for, for the issue about uh, automation of. Um, and I think it's it, it's really important to, to think about this, this idea of philosophy after automation. Um, and yeah, I, I don't have a paper, so I'm just collecting some, some thought about um, the introduction of the of the issue and about uh, the other the other interventions. Um, so I, I think that it's important mostly because we are at a stage of technology where basically there is a system, automatic system for knowledge production. And I think this is really important and this mark a sort of difference with respect to previous technology. Um, so now I think that we can use technology, uh, predictive technology, to produce science, to produce theories, and this is quite new. Um, so in, in some way, um, in some way, there is um, an end of philosophy, uh, meaning that um, there is no more place for um, philosophical critique of science. Meaning that, for example, in the Kantian system, uh, we had scientific knowledge, and it was just producing knowledge according to some a priori, and then we had philosophical reflection, and it was a critique of science because there was no science of science. So science was without uh, her own reflection. But today, with algorithmic predictive technology, we have a science reflecting on itself meaning that predictions are updated all the time. And we have a plurality of predictions and an automatic system of reflecting on predictions, uh, which leaves no space for philosophy anymore. Um, so in some way, I think that if we had a sort of um, overlapping between um, mechanicism and organicism before in, in cybernetics, uh, meaning that there was this way of thinking of the biological through uh, the systems, uh, technological system, and a way of thinking of technological system through uh, biological organisms. Today, we have a further stage, which is a stage where the whole evolution of the organic is automatized in some way. So it's no more the organism and, and the machine, it's the history of evolution and the machine. So the ma machines are producing the history of knowledge, they are producing the evolution of knowledge itself. Uh, so I think this is a, a further interesting, interesting step, which is implied in, um, I think, um, Bayesian way of conceiving knowledge. Um, so I, I've been uh, working uh, quite a bit on this Bayesian system of knowledge production. And, and the idea in, in Bayesianism is that um, you conceive knowledge as a learning process. Knowledge is not just, okay, I have my theory and I apply them. It's a way of producing hypotheses in order to update hypotheses themselves. Uh, it's another way of conceiving induction, where induction is not just um, I have my, my theory, but it's about the probability of the theory. It's a probabilistic way of conceiving knowledge. And in this probabilistic way of conceiving knowledge, we also have a possibility of developing knowledge itself. Uh, so what we have to do is to increase, to find the evidence, to increase the probability of some hypothesis, 
hypotheses um, are meant to be useful to solve problems. Uh, and there is a feedback uh, from which we can learn uh, how to modify, how to update uh, hypotheses um, thanks to the consequences of hypotheses. And this is also all, all the issue of risk, for example, uh, where we have this way of conceiving uh, the dangerous consequences of our actions, the dangerous consequences of our, our theories. It's because we do, we, we try, and then we update the hypothesis when we see that um, we cannot really uh, satisfy um, our preferences because there is a danger. So we have to modify strategies, we have to modify um, the decision making, basically it's a theory of decision making. Um, so um, what I was interested in was in, in trying to, to see this, the history or, or the ground for this probabilistic approach. Uh, and I think that it's uh, kind of overlooked in the sense that today technology uh, is grounded in a probabilistic approach um, of induction. And um, I think that this keeps us back to this um, debate between um, Heidegger and Carnap that uh, Babette mentioned before. Uh, and I think this is really important, uh, meaning that in some way uh, for Heidegger, the end of philosophy or the end of metaphysics was the beginning of logical empiricism. And in some way, it was the beginning of this probabilistic way of approaching induction, uh, which basically leads through cybernetics to uh, this um, way of conceiving um, science as an automatizable system of knowledge production, which actually does not leave space for philosophy anymore. So there is a problem because uh, there is no uh, more need for something which is outside science to criticize science because science is criticizing itself, is evolving. Um, so predictions are produced and they are compared and they are choose and then we can change uh, and everything is open. It's a, an open process and there is an unpredictability of the process of, um, of knowledge itself, meaning that we, we don't know what we will believe tomorrow and it's really evident. Um, so, I think that there is this, this idea of openness, of uncertainty, which is now uh, inside science itself and inside technology itself uh, as a way of conceiving the old technological system as an evolving system, not only organic, but something more. So we are mechanizing the history of evolution in some way. And all the models are really inspired by evolution and there is this sort of obligation to innovate, this obligation to uh, let things evolve. Um, so then my problem with all that um, is that of course, I'm, I'm interested in uh, what happens to philosophy in, at this point, meaning that uh, is, is it true that there is no more place for philosophy in this system? And mostly what, what I'm afraid of, of what is um, I'm questioning is this idea that um, the rational uh, model, so the model for the rational agent uh, or the decision maker is the same in uh, artificial intelligence, for example, which is the Bayesian model for statistical inference and in economics. Uh, so they are kind of the same model of a rational agent. Um, so basically for me, the, the, the question of philosophy after automation is also a question of resisting this sort of uh, domination of the model of rational agent, which is in economics and the way in which it's kind of um, controlling or informing what we mean for the development of knowledge or for the evolution of knowledge. Uh, so I think that uh, philosophy after automation should also try to resist uh, to this kind of um, homogenization of the conception of knowledge to a system, automated system of knowledge production. Okay, I stop here. 
Oh, thank you very much. Uh, and, and I also have to, to mention that towards the you know, besides the, towards the end of the article, I'm also trying to also go back to, to, to Leo Tart. Um, um, so, so the reading of, of, of Wittgenstein of the language game and the necessity to to invent new rules for the games and the new games, and I think it is, is very important to to think of uh, you know the the, the, the certain limit uh, that we have been discussing and the other possibilities or. Uh, of philosophy, and which may not be, I mean, which doesn't have to be one Heidegger, uh, you know, means by, 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 by the question of being, but uh, probably there are other games, uh, other rules of games to be invented. Um, so, um, well, I, I would suggest that we go directly to Mihal and then we come back to these questions. Okay, thank you, Yuk, uh, for organizing this uh, transcontinental event, surely. Uh, and um, I'll try to, to comment on philosophy of the automation, um, starting from the Heideggerian's term, the task, uh, in his uh, text, uh, the, the End of Philosophy and the Task of Thinking. And uh, I think that there are several tasks um, to do by philosophy today, and uh, I will introduce uh, just a few of them that I find particularly uh, important. So um, the task number one um, for philosophy after automation um, is to me uh, to foster what Bernard Stiegler uh, defines as a culture of this automatization. And uh, let me explain my position. I, I will probably a very little to say about uh, philosophy after automation if I hadn't uh, encountered uh, Bernard Stiegler and, and dived in uh, his prolific writings. Um, so to me, um, the first task for philosophy uh, after automation is to literally read Bernard Stiegler. Of course, not only him, but uh, try to take uh, Bernard Stiegler for the departing point in uh, this task uh, to, to answer what uh, philosophy of the automation uh, actually means or might mean. Um, and there are two reasons for, 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 for this claim. On the one, because on the one hand, uh, Stigler shows that the technical question and uh, political economy uh, are hence inseparable. And on the other hand, he shows that the link between the biosphere and what he refers to as exosomatization in the wake, uh, in the wake of the biologist uh, Alfred Lotka is fundamental. Um, so um, all issues related to automation and uh, the generalized automatization, as Stigler has it, must be addressed in the context of a new political economy and in the context of uh, the Anthropocene. Um, so the task for philosophy uh, to me is precisely to explain how um, automatization makes uh, this culture of this automatization possible, which is quite paradoxical, and why the benefits from automatization should be put at the service of societies um, trying to overcome the Anthropocene. So we need to discuss the automation and the automatization, that is the concretization of uh, automation in the social context of the absence of meaning uh, in relation to our jobs, also in the context of uh, the ever-growing loss of uh, the feeling of existence, and especially in, uh, in relation to what Stigler uh, defines as uh, the generalized proletarianization that is a systemic loss of knowledge, uh, of all forms of uh, knowledge, the knowledge of how to live, how to do, but also how to theorize and how to conceptualize. And um, this knowledge, uh, this loss of knowledge hits uh, us all actually, it hits all classes of population, if you like. Uh, so fighting against the, the structural 
uh, source of these laws. Um, it's not really about class conflicts. It's not really about uh, abolishing capitalism, if, uh, not, neither. And the problem, the huge problem is that the automatization makes this loss of knowledge even bigger. And this is something um, unprecedented. So it does uh, the common conviction that knowledge means information. Um, this is an utterly wrong a conviction, Stigler says. Information is not knowledge. It cannot be reduced to, to, to knowledge. For example, too much information makes noise and it destroys knowledge rather than enhances it. So we can speak of knowledge only when there is a transformation of information. And this transformation is always a more or less critical gesture. And the, the problem uh, with automatization, the problem with our digitalized societies is that automatization tends to make this, transforma this transformation structurally, functionally, and institutionally impossible. So, and so my point here is obviously not uh, to, 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 to blame automation. It is rather about to open a debate on the epistemological limits of automation and to resituate uh, this debate in, social, in the social, political, and economic context of the Anthropocene. So that would be the, the, the task number one. The task number two, uh, for philosophy after automation uh, would be to challenge the, um, the conviction that to think is to reckon, a conviction which has morphed into something like uh, to think is to simulate with the advent of AI. This is actually an old conviction. Uh, it stems from uh, the first uh, cybernetics and cognitive sciences uh, took over uh, this uh, cybernetic conviction and this conviction this conviction ended up um, some, as something like an undisputable or quite metaphysical truth um, with the, the co-evolution of computer science, neurosciences, and AI. Uh, of course, when, when Heidegger uh, said that um, cybernetics uh, took over philosophy, um, Cybernetics as, 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 as science was already about to lose, uh, to lose its moment, uh, uh, momentum. Nevertheless, the first cybernetics, the, the spirit of, of the first cybernetics has survived with the cognitivist metaphor of computation, computational mind, which is after all an extension of um, the, the cybernetic analogy between the mind and computer or more generally between the living and, 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 and the machinic. And it is important to recall this analogy, especially because it seems to show why and how autonomy could be devoid of, uh, of potential meanings, all potential meanings, and, and uh, confused with um, automatism, automation, right? Uh, so, and I think that this is important um, to recall this uh, cybernetic conviction that uh, to think is to reckon um, in the context of our discussion on automation. Because um, if cybernetics uh, was the end of philosophy, as Heidegger uh, argues, uh, then generalized automatization might appear as the end of cybernetics. Why? Because cybernetics was still uh, um, a theoretical science, right? So, so and, and the automatization, the logic, the very logic of automatization is anti-cybernetic and anti-theoretical. Um, and this is the moment we're in at this redoubled end, the end of philosophy and the end of cybernetics. Uh, and some amateur of the so-called data sciences um, defined this moment as the end of theory, saying that, um, I quote Anderson um, in, from his famous article published in The Wired, with enough data, the, number, the numbers speak for, the, for themselves, correlation is enough, 
um, at the epoch of, of petabytes. So no, we, we don't need to waste our time for determine, determining um, uh, causation. Well, I don't think so. And so in this context, uh, the second task for philosophy um, or the task of thinking, if you like, um, is definitely not to resist to automation, but rather to reinvent the function of thinking. To put it in Stigler's vocabulary, uh, we need to carefully think uh, automation, penser l'automatisation, but penser with an A rather than with an E, that is, uh, to heal what can be healed or to, or to care rather than uh, to think sim to, to simply think so so obviously uh, this means um, of course uh, a total uh, reinvention of the famous heideggerian uh, question what is called thinking which should be now addressed at, as what is called caring um test, task number three uh, for philosophy of the automation um, would be to acknowledge that uh, philosophy um, in the 21st century won't fly without sciences. Uh, so it wouldn't be perhaps very wise to um, repeat after, after Heidegger that science doesn't think. On the contrary, science does think as Dominique Lecour uh, argues uh, in, in his small book, uh, Contre la Peur, Against the Fear, uh, published in uh, 1990. However, uh, the problem is that the existence of this thought uh, coming from science that uh, Lecour uh, discusses in this book is not um, is that this existence is not recognized by, by the overwhelming majority of those who engage in a reputed scientific activity. So the future of philosophy and at the same time the future of science, Lecour says, depends on whether we are able to rethink thinking without excluding from the realm of thought uh, scientific thinking. So what, what I'm trying to say is that we urgently need a new epistemology, uh, an epistemological break, if you like, in the sense of Bachelard, in order to do away with epistemological obstacles, uh, which makes us unable to carefully think automation. Uh, we need this break in order to shape an epistemological alternative uh, to what the Polish writer Stanisław Lem in his uh, famous treatise, Summa Technologia, published in um, 1964, described as the general tendency to mathematization of sciences, including disciplines that did not previously use any math methods, such as biology, psychology, and medicine. And Lam, in the 60s, uh, pointed out that uh, this tendency uh, to mathematization um, is slowly extending to uh, the humanities. So in the epoch of uh, the generalized proletarianization, sorry, the generalized automatization, uh, we're experiencing this tendency uh, in quite absolute terms. Now, the task um, for philosophical um, and scientific thinking would be to reverse this tendency and produce a kind of a counter tendency. And this task is clearly not against mathematics. It is rather for math mathematics. It is, um, it is, however, against uh, a, a thoughtless uh, mathematization of the world. Georges Conguilhem said that, um, science, that science is a form of culture. If Conguilhem is right, and I think he is, uh, we must first acknowledge that we have not developed a techno-scientific culture yet um, to discuss the epistemology of automation in the 21st century. So a techno-scientific culture to come that philosophy of the automation must call for needs to take up 
the epistemological question, which is hence, of course, inseparable uh, from the technical question. So it would be a huge mistake to stick with the epistemology of information or the epistemology of communication inherited from the 20th century. It would be also a huge mistake, I think, to, to stick with the what you um, describes uh, in uh, the introduction to our issue as the epistemology of feedback. Uh, we need a, a different uh, epistemology also in order to, to, to go beyond uh, what uh, you describe you as the ontolo uh, the the ontological um, um, the ontological um, apology uh, of technology inherited from the uh, 20th century, right? So, so I think that the issue here is first of all um, a new a new kind of um, epistemology. So I will stop here because there is also one important task for me, but I don't want to, 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 to go beyond 10 minutes uh, for each speaker. So thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, especially very important that you bring up the question of political economy uh, and that uh, the relation between political economy, automation, um, and that we, you know, we have been discussing about this for the past 10 years. Um, uh, the concept of information and so on. Um, that to 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 um, no, very very interesting to to think about how to deautomatize through automation. How to de -auto, auto how to disautomatize through automation. Um, and I think it is you know we are uh, not speaking about political AI in this. I think Akita has something to say about this understanding of the AI in this, but also at the same time, I think there is something yet to be to, to be negotiated. And we, we, we were trying to, we didn't succeed in negotiating with each other in the occasion of the debate on the, on the interpretation of Diderot's uh, paradox uh, of the comedian, uh, where Diderot says that what is a good comedian is the one who is able to automatize, automatize his own body first. So a good comedian is someone who is able to, to practice, to rehearse, and to, you know, he embodies the automatics of, of movements, of speech, of, uh, of, of, of the facial expressions, and so on. And only through this uh, self-automatization that the comedian is able to improvise. So, so that is you know, one, one, one example to think of, of that. Well, for me, I think that this, this example has also sort of limit uh, today, you know, uh, compared with, uh, with uh, uh, be, be, because the, the, the limit, of course, is uh, very much based on the, on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the, maybe we can say, I can say it on the belief of the body, that the body provides the medium through which, uh, or what in, the, in terms of the Simon de Maise, uh might call uh, an associated medium, that the body provides an associated medium for technology, for technical objects, in order to disautomatize or to give new roles to the to the tool, uh, to the uh, to, to the to the technical object. Um, and this is precisely what 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 Stigler and also the work on Terry Michael called the um, organized inorganic. The, the 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 organized inorganic uh, very much reposes on on this capacity of the body, uh, and I think it is today maybe we we we, we confront a different situation. You know, to, to, to de develop this strategy of this automatization. So, but, but, but then the, 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 the re-articulation of the, of the definition of information and the theoretical computational theory, you know, the task that Stigler left before he died, um, I think is still something to, 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 uh, to be followed up and it is, it, it is very important to, 
And, and th that this question we have been discussing in the past 10 years, uh, but maybe this is another, there will be another occasion to go into more details on information, uh, calculability, Turing, and Gerdel, and so on. So um, um, maybe we can now you know, uh, open to questions. Uh, you know, we, we should adjust those questions. I don't know if you, how are we going to do with time? Um, uh, because I'm probably the, one of the worst, uh, where I, I am second to Bernard Spiegler as uh, the worst uh, moderator. He always had a two hours overrun, I probably only had one. <laughs> Uh, but I, I think we should go back to the, to the questions and also, you know, the, the exchange between us. Um, so, so if I may, maybe I could, I, I, I wanted to, uh, you know, pick up, pick up. I don't, I don't think we can pick up all the questions, but maybe we pick up kind of two or three questions. Uh, if, uh, so I take the liberty to address one of the questions by 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 Enyarika. Uh, a colleague uh, from, from Berlin. Uh, so um, she said, I was very thankful for Peter pointing out that for Heidegger, both organicism and mechanism follow ultimately not an opposed but the same logic. The answer for philosophy after automation then seems to go beyond the reconciliation of organism and mechanism towards rethinking the relation between the event. In its non effectivity, non causality, maybe radical contingency, and recursivity, where then would you, uh, the question is raised to me, Peter and the Katharina, where then would you situate the event if they would be on the logic of recursivity? This is, of course, aims at the related question of a future that would not be mere repetition, even if considered as a reflexive and the possi possibility of doing something with it in the sense of etwas mit der Zukunft anzufangen. So uh, I don't know who, who would like to, uh, Peter, would you like to start? Yeah, maybe let me first uh, read the question. Uh, <laughs> I thought that ready for you. But <laughs> I, I was busy with uh, the chat. I was. I, I'm doing many. Uh, I'm multitasking a little bit. But if someone wants to re respond to it uh, in the meantime, or maybe maybe I respond to us and, and why we were thinking. Uh, so, um, well, I think the, the in, in the in the in the introduction material, I have the quotes from Heidegger. And Heidegger says that it maybe it takes it still takes some time, or maybe it still takes a long time for us to realize. Where well, let me find out the quotes first. He says that um, he says that it might very well still take a considerable time to recognize that the organism and the organic presence or presents themselves as the mechanistic technological triumph of modality over the domain of growth nature. Um, I copy and paste here in the chat. And this quote from Heidegger is from the Black Knot book, and uh, it's, a, it's a written. This, I think it's from, from 1940 to 1946, so before the publication of Norbert Finner's Cybernetics. And uh, well, of course, later Heidegger has read uh, no, uh, the cybernetics very carefully, and also Prohag Winter's uh, uh, work on cybernetics. Um, so it, it seems to it seems to me that Heidegger already sees that. Oh, in my own words, you know, you, I, I wanted to think, I wanted to try to enforce that the or, the organism or the, the the thinking about organismic or the uh, organicism was a condition of thinking or condition of philosophizing, let's say, uh, from Kant. And it seems that this condition uh, become uh, uh, lost its effectivity. Uh, for example, in this statement of, 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 of Heidegger, and that was later proved in a way by cybernetics. So, um, 
in this sense, how are we going to think about you know the the, the kind of um, uh, the, the future of thinking and that without being or falling a uh, victim or prey to this idea uh, of of cybernetic movements or what you call the positive feedback or feedback loop. So Heidegger in the later work, for example, in 1967, in his talk uh, in Athens, the, um, what is called, the Herkunft, uh, der Künstler und die Bestimmung des Denkens in 1967, where Heidegger also asked this question, what would be the Zukunft, what would be the future of art? in the time of cybernetics. Um, and I think that this could be uh, right. Um, I'm not saying that Heidegger provide us an answer, but I think that the Heidegger was aware of this question. And uh, uh, how can we think about, uh, or how can we think of moving away from this feedback loop, which I also call it recursivity. You know, feedback was the term used by first all the cybernetics. And in the second order cybernetics in the work of Luhmann of von Fresta uh, is a, they call it recursivity. recursive. Um, so how can we get you know, how can we get 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 rid of this uh, get away from 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 this positive feedback loop? Well, there are different ways. There are different ways. And in my new book, which will come out next month, I try to address two two approaches. One is called the tragic, tragic. And one is called a Taoist. And I think of that now is a tragedist. Uh, Stigler is a tragedist, uh, is one of the, uh, the great tragedies. Uh, Nietzsche of those tragedies. Um, and, um, um, and the other way, the Taoist. But I'm not going to talk about that uh, here. Uh, but I want, want, want to just to, to, to mention about the um, um, one. one um, something that was already addressed uh, much earlier by, by Gregory Basin. So Basin says that you know, an alcoholic always, an alcoholic wants to get rid of alcohol. But one day she saw a, a, a bottle of beer in the fridge. She said, you know, I haven't been eat, drinking for a long time. Why, you know, it's only one beer. It's not going to kill me. So then the, uh, he, after one beer, he said, well, you know, only one, I have already started, you know, what's the problem of having a second one? And after the second one, he said, you know, my day is already, you know, full of alcohol. What is the point of not having a third? Then he got drunk again. And that is possibly better. And I have to say that, you know, more, we moderns are alcoholics, you know, moderns are alcoholics. That we always uh, we, we, we fall prey to this to this pattern, but also to this epistemology, as you know, we can say uh, that. Um, and it was also the moment that Basin said something, and uh, that he said, "Well, maybe we need to have a recursive epistemology, a recursive epistemology." And a recursive epistemology is that which makes us or, 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 or take us out of the loop into another loop. Now, the same thing could be said to the question of alienation that uh, Katerina was talking about, the kind of automatism of capital. And uh, then Basin gives us two ways to think about this. Um, so I, I always answer with that just on one way is that when the alcoholic has an accident or has a fatal disease, that means we should call it hitting bottom. So there's no way out, so you have to stop it. Or uh, like the alcoholic, uh, like the um, alcoholic anonymous, you know, you read the Bible and you feel that there is another loop taking place and that is wrong. Um, uh, maybe today we, we are not in uh, uh, any position, any good position to talk about God, you know, after Nietzsche, after uh, the whole process of secularization. 
Uh, but for Heidegger, it's still pos possible to talk about being, to talk about being, the, 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 um, the unthought or, or the incalculable, the uncalculable or the incalculable. Um, and I think that is also, that may be the starting point uh, where we can think about uh, uh, new epistemologies I wouldn't say one epistemology, but new epistemologies, or even new epistems. I made a distinction between these two. So, um, um, and uh, the question of being for me is such a question. Uh, Heidegger's question of being was for me uh, such an approach uh, to, to think. And only by thinking about the question of being um, that According to Heidegger, it is possible to think about a free relation to technology, you know, on the first page of the Frage nach der Technik, you know, to prepare for free relation to technology. But I must say that, you know, the question of being, or to think about being, is not the only approach, is not the only method for us to get out of this. Uh, there are apparently others there, uh, and we have to think about it. So that would be my response to Angelica's uh, question. So I don't know. Yeah. If yeah, I haven't read Heidegger in ages, so I wouldn't, especially not on this topic, so I, I wouldn't have anything to add to it. I don't know if Peter has some something. Yeah, you, you uh, uh, your cosmotechnics, of course, adds. Um, let's say a non-technological dimension to the question of technology. Yeah? When you talk about uh, a cosmological a priori or, or a cosmic reality, and uh, you always say, you know, uh, uh, in the West, we think from being, but in China, there is no such a thing as being. There's uh, the nothing maybe, and in other cultures, there are different uh, cosmological dimensions from out of which to think technology. Uh, and I definitely agree with that, and that's very, uh, I think, very uh, productive and very, very exciting. Uh, but what I wanted to point towards is, and I'm fascinated by that, if you read uh, the late Heidegger on the Ereignis, he always emphasizes uh, that it is nothing causal, right? Uh, being is not something uh, that we can uh, control, right? It's not something that we can uh, achieve. Huh? There is, that's why there is this strategy of releasement, of lassen, uh, of, of non-willing, of abgeschiedenheit. There's a completely different trajectory that Heidegger uh, takes, right? Uh, and, and so that, that's what I find fascinating. And that's also why he comes, of course, with, uh, with the divine. Uh, there, there, it, it, it's, it's, it's a dimension that um, is, yeah, is completely transcendent uh, to the causal domain, right? And um, yeah, that's that's a point that I wanted to make in, in my uh, 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 response uh, to your uh, uh, project. Let's say what, what, I, what I call, sometimes call the verticality, right? Of technology as in framing. <laughs> Um, right, thank you. So uh, uh, maybe we can go to uh, a, a second question. Uh, uh, let me try to find a, 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 a non-exclusive one. Um, uh, uh, does philosophy after automation also refer to philosophy beyond after the human? As many humanistic notions like free will, desire, hierarchy of, of needs, etc., seems to matter less here, what kind of situation we can envisage at the advent of a totalizing scenario of automation and mechanicity? Uh, this is a very general question. So, the general question also has its uh, merit. I don't know if anyone would like to address. But I, one thing I can assure you, assure you, you know, is that none of our authors is a humanist, or is a human-centric thinker. 
Um, so, what are the other questions? Uh, there's another question from uh, Jorge Pro. I was wondering if any of the panelists are familiar with the reference checkings at the as information theory, where he argues for digital philosophy to bring away with real numbers and continuity, proposing a universal computation not only as a, unavoidable but as a realistic, basically arguing for automation of thought, understanding is compression, but thinking beyond automation points towards the uncomputable, uncomprehensible. The heritage of algorithm that is digital philosophy defend. Uh, very interesting question. Uh, I don't know, Anna, would you like to? I, you probably know well about the work of uh, chatting. No? No, I don't. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, and anyone else? If no, I will make a quick. Uh, uh, Response to that, uh, because I, I I did I did I did work on uh, well I did wrote quite quite something on on, on this idea of epistemology as information theory and his uh, his information uh, what do you call it uh, algorithmic information theory you know that uh, a student if he belongs and 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 uh, you know the 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 idea is. Um, you know, ba ba basically, we can say that the the the, the it has to do with the compression. You know, with the question of of of, of computability, that the whole world, um, um, you know, in the in the in the sense that what Leibniz called the best uh, the best of the possible world is you know is that which is could be could be thought of of as a computable um, in in that sense. Um, and what is opposed to the computable, of course, is the 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 the, un, the incomputable. Um, but I think you know I I I wanted to I tried to propose that beyond the computable and incomplete or incomputable, uh, we have to add uh, something we call the incalculable, or in the sense of Heidegger, in the sense of Derrida, in the sense of Stigler. So the computable, incomputable, and uh, uh, incalculable, these are three different things. Now the difference between the incomputable and the incalculable is that, uh, for me, I think the incomputable is a still mathematical concept. The incomputable is still mathematical concept, but the incalculable is a, doesn't have to be a, 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 a mathematical concept. Um, but then the question is that you know how to think about the question of the the how to think about the question of the of the of the incalculable uh, with machines with technologies and and, and with automations uh, and I want to refer this to to Miha's uh, intervention intervention uh, and I think that is precisely where the you know, probably the entry point towards the um, a, a, a new political economy, but also to Anna's, uh, to Anna's uh, 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 critique of the of the of the inductive method of, of philosophy, you know, the, the one possibility to 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 uh, reinvent rules and games. Can I uh, can I comment? Or can I take the question of Rodrigo? Yeah. Yeah, because you know I. I do not I don't know uh, this book uh, of Gregory Chatin, but I think that uh, the uh, the question of understanding is essential uh, because if we understand understanding uh, in Kantian terms, that is as the intellect verstand, um, under then understanding is um, a purely analytical power that can be automated, right? So uh, in this sense. Um, thinking or reason uh, in the sense of Kant has to go beyond uh, what uh, is actually right uh, it it has uh, point to uh, the uh, the um, the improbable the uncomputable right so I think that the, the crux of uh, uh, of the matter is in this 
old Kantian distinction between uh, between intellect, the intellect, and 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 reason. And of course, how we we understand how we define uh, reason in the 21st century has to become the object of debate. However, um, our problem today in relation to automatization is the the, the exteriorized power of the intellect. And this is why we, 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 can, we, can, we can talk about the irrationality, uh, which is uh, actually our everyday lives, right? With, uh, uh, in the generalized computer automatization. Well, I, I just want to add one simple uh, like clar clarification this, uh, of this, uh, this phrase, understanding is compassion. Not because it has to be unpacked because of what he means that so let me give you an example if if you have an image now you have a compressed image if the algorithm used to compress it, it, the image is larger than the size of the image itself it is not compression it's not compression so you have to produce something that is much smaller for compression and this compression means recursively uh, uh, calculable. Yeah. yeah. So um, um, that 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 that's, that's so so the question of, of computability is is a, is fundamental for the for this definition of understanding. Uh, right. So I think we address all the questions. Oh, that, well, there's another one uh, on psychoanalysis. As a, a psychoanalyst, I was particularly interested in the smattering of references I had earlier with respect to Lacan. I wonder if there were any further thoughts on how Lacan's uh, psychoanalytic concepts are thought to be related to the question of automation here. Also, the references seem to have been more related. Uh, language, signification, and fantasy, but does anyone here also find the use of Lacanian concept of the body in the real and the source to elucidate our relations to the question of machine automation today? Okay, this is in the chat, right? Not in the Q&A section. Are you saying in the Q&A? I can't see it <laughs> anyway. Uh, anyway, okay, I, I heard the question you read. It. Maybe, it, oh yeah, now I see it. Uh, I'm assuming it refers to my presentation because I talked about Lacan, or is it addressed to all the all of the panelists? Uh, I, I don't get that part whom it is addressed to. I, I can just comment the... the, the <laughs> So yeah, I, I spoke about Lacan and automation. I can just uh, comment that this concept is developed in the four fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis uh, by Lacan, where he takes the uh, borrows the, the concept of uh, the automaton as opposed to the uh, incident or uh, accident that disturbs the automaton of uh meaning production let's put it that way um and so so he takes up these two concepts from um Aristotel aristotelian philosophy um in order to uh, produce his own own theory of you know signification as automation language as an automaton uh, uh language as a pleasure principle that you know, constantly, ceaselessly produces science, and it's it is the work of the pleasure principle, as opposed to the symptom. Um, uh, the symptom is always the incursion of the real into the process of sign making, of uh, meaning making, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, as elaborated by Lacan. So he operates with these two. Uh, notions, the automaton and the, the incursion of, you know, uh, uh, literally the, the real, 
you know, the trauma that has not been subjected to uh, language has not been assigned meaning, has not been interpreted yes, uh, yet appears as, uh, as a symptom uh, usually. So that holds the name and the status of he in ancient, put in ancient Greek, as opposed to the automaton of constant making sense, which is equated with the pleasure principle in Lacan. So it's not like uh, I've added and projected the, the notion of uh, the automaton onto Lacan. He actually does operate with, with the concept itself. And it's, um, as I said in this book under the title of four fundamental uh, concepts of uh, psychoanalysis. Right, any, anyone else would like to respond? Uh, otherwise, I saw that there was a good question addressed to me, uh, but I probably do not want to uh, give it to my, 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 if the recursive contingency is uh, in relation to difference and repetition, I will leave this for the future. <laughs> To explain the relation between uh, recursivity and contingency and difference and repetition of the rest. Uh, so, um, um, and on the question of decolonization, I, I think that you know, uh, Jeta has already mentioned on that. And that was something that I tried, I've been trying to do uh, as well to, to, to develop uh, what I call a planetary thinking. Uh, how to think about the planetary and, and also the, 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 the in, in terms of, of what I call the biodiversity, new diversity and techno diversity. And Peter wanted to add to it an auto diversity. And, um, but it, you know, these are, 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 are kind of motifs uh, to think of the question of, of, of diversification. Uh, because I have to say that for me, the question of ethics of technology, the question, fundamental question of ethics today is a problem less about you know, how much, um, what kind of laws we should impose. I mean, of course, very important on robots, on, on AIs, but more fundamentally on the question of diversity. Um, and 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 uh, that that's uh, that's something that uh, I have been uh, developing. Uh, so I think we address all the questions. Uh, so I want to, uh, and there's no other no main questions. So I wanted to thank everyone. Uh, it must be really tired also for the audience as well. But thank you very much. Uh, you know, again for the participation. Uh, of um, in this uh, special issue, but also for for your time to participate in this launch, and also to everyone uh, uh, and and every everyone um, for participating. And again, you know, this issue, this special issue, is open access online until end of July. So if you haven't read it, you still have the time to read it and to spread the news. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, thank you everyone and uh, have a nice day, have a nice evening. And, uh, uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you love. very much. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.